Good evening, everyone. I am Tom Bragg. We've got Nicola Terry is going to speak as well, and Bart Hummels is helping us. This evening, we've got the four main sections, uh, and in between each, there'll be uh, time for questions. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Nicola to do the uses of thermal imaging section. Thermal cameras. Thermal cameras are great. Um, it's a picture and it shows you the temperature of the surface. <laughs> you can also get little infrared thermometers, which are jolly useful. These, um, this is the one on the left. It, it's only got one pixel, whereas the thermal camera has got lots of pixels. Um, typically 120 by 160, not as much as you get in a visible camera, um, but um, it is very, very useful at, at that resolution. Um, so you're, you're seeing infrared, which you can't normally see, so you see it in false colour, that's absolutely fine, and you're looking at the temperature of the surface because that's what the camera's looking at. But that reveals what is behind, and in particular it's very useful for revealing heat loss, which is what we're all about, because generally speaking when things are losing heat they get colder, which is a bit of a tip. Um, all objects glow um, for which part of the spectrum they're glowing in depends on their um, on their temperature. Um, so everything is glowing in infrared, no matter, down to absolute zero, which is a bit ridiculous. And as I say, we use this to identify um, bits of our house that are losing heat, um, as one thing anyway. And here we've got a picture where we're looking up um, at the top floor ceiling. So we're looking up, I mean, the, behind that surface is, is the loft. Um, we're inside, so so we're looking at, th um, if things are cold, it means they're losing heat to the outside. Do you want to guess at what we might be looking here? Whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> you're seeing missing loft insulation, <laughs> primarily. That's what those things are. Like, what do you think this um, this darker area is? Loft hatch. Yeah. Water tank. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, probably a loft hatch that's not insulated. They're quite bad. You'll notice the color scale, um, and we tend to use the same palette for all of the things. It's all false colors, so you can know anything you like, but this is what we tend to stick with. So red is hot, blue and black is very cold, and the sort of greeny yellows are in the middle. Um, that is a poorly insulated loft hatch. And the camera, um, different cameras have sort of slightly different things, but you normally get at least one um, temperature indication actually usually in the middle of the screen. And here we've got some spot temperatures arranged. Now, so the, the main part of the ceiling is at 24 and the loft hatch is at 16.9. That's a seven degrees temperature difference, which is a lot. Um, admittedly, it's not a very large area, but it is still a lot. Um, and the missing insulation is also pretty bad. But if it's just one or two degrees difference, then unless it's a huge area, you wouldn't worry about it. Here's another ceiling case. This time we're looking, um, and this round thing that looks like a um, something kind of UFO is um, a light, um, a down lighter. And you can see clearly that it's a bit colder than the rest of the ceiling. The surface of the light is colder. Any ideas why that might be the case? This, you, part of this is, you know, you're seeing the temperature at the surface, but you have to see what's causing. You have to do a bit of detective work and guessing. What do you think is causing that cold there? Any ideas? Well, I, I don't think you're supposed. Don't think you're supposed to insulate over down lighters, are you? Because of the fire Correct. risk. So yeah, so yeah. There, there shouldn't be any any uh, rock wool or anything over that. So that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. You have to be quite careful that down lighters don't get too hot. Although less less important now with LEDs um, because they don't get quite so hot anyway. But it's still yeah. important. Now. Bear in mind what I said earlier, you can see there's a cold patch here also in the in the corner of the room. So that's the sort of where the ceiling meets the walls. Um, that is actually very common. It's not a massive temperature difference, um, but it's very common in the corner. And it's primarily simply because the airflow doesn't go right into the corner. And at that corner, there's often more surfaces for it to sort of lose heat on. So you will usually find the edges are slightly cooler and the corners are, are even more cooler. But as long as it's only very localised, that's OK. Um, OK, here we're looking at a different kind of heat loss. 
it's a cold fridge, which basically means it's a bit that isn't insulated. Any ideas what we're looking at? Bottom of the door. Bottom of the door. I'm not hearing. Right. Bottom of the door. Bottom of the door. So, so this bit here, the blue bit, which is the cold bit, what do you think that is? Draft, no draft excluder. Mm, no, this isn't a draft so much. It's really, really sharp edges, especially there. Um, it's it, it's it's a very dis, very sharp edge. Drafts tend to be fuzzy. You'll see that in a minute. Um, what we're actually seeing is the the threshold. You know the sort of concrete step, and and it, it goes right through from inside to outside, which is a bit of a bummer um, from the point of view of heat loss because that's a really good. Thing. However, you're right that putting a draft excluder or putting the mat closer up would actually help to reduce that. So we've got a whole carpet and a front door and a cold bridge in the middle. Okay, this is what drafts tend to look like. They tend to be really sort of fuzzy and with fuzzy edges. Here, this is another door with, which has got lots of drafts. Um, so you've got the draft coming under the door there. And the edge is fuzzy. We call it feathery. Sometimes it really does look feathery. And here's another way we can check, which is a bit crude. Um, an internal wall. So we're on the inside of the house still. Um, we're on. If you look at an internal wall, which has got a warm room on the other side, there shouldn't be any heat transfers to speak of at all because they're both it's warm on both sides. But if you've got an outside wall, then you're going to get heat loss to the outside. So the, the surface of the the inside surface of the outside wall will be cooler. Um, and if it's not much cooler, then that's brilliant. It means you're well insulated walls. But if it's more than a degree or two cooler, then it could really use some insulation. And you should and um, you shouldn't get that if you've got uh, if you've got if your walls are insulated, you shouldn't have a bigger temperature difference than that. So um, that's a sort of large area one. Uh, and although we're talking about primarily about heat loss, it's also quite interesting to look at heating systems. So here's a normal radiator and here, well, here's a, this radiator is functioning correctly and this radiator isn't, it's not nearly as hot. Um, and the reason I think is pretty obvious and you could tell with, if you're just touching the radiator, it would be pretty obvious. Um, it's got air in the top um, and you can bleed it. There are other things that can go wrong with radiators, but this is a very common one and very easy to fix. Now, interestingly, fixing the air in your radiator will not actually reduce your heating demand. In fact, it might even increase it, because it, but it will mean that you'll actually get warm. And there are advantages um, to actually getting warm. And if you've got underfloor heating, um, which not many of you do, but maybe you're thinking of it. It's an absolute nightmare trying to find out what's wrong with it, unless you use an infrared camera. If, if if you can check, like here, we can see that parts of the floor is not heating up, and that's probably due to um, some kind of restriction in the hot water flow. And you don't have to dig up the floor to, to actually check the pipes in order to check that there's a problem. You only have to dig it up if you found that there's a problem, which is quite useful. Um, now, this is real heat loss. Um, fairly obviously here we're looking at pipes and um, this, the, the, the yellowy pipe is, is, is hot and that one is even hotter. Um, and that is leaking heat into the, into the room or wherever it is. Actually, it might be outside. I think this picture might be outside. Um, if it's outside, then that's definitely a waste of heat. If it's inside, it is really even if you're in the heating system and this is a heating pipe, because you're not able to control where that heat is going. You know, what's the point in having thermostatic radiator valves on your radiators if the pipes are heating the place up anyway? So, uh, but it obviously is less important if it's inside the thermal, en thermal envelope of the house and, you won't, and, and they're heating pipes. Because if they're hot water pipes, then, um, you know, for your taps, then that's even sillier because you don't, you certainly don't want them, the heat from them even in, in the summertime. Okay, um, I think that might be the last in this section. Yep. Um, so time for our first set of questions. 
Um, uh, there's a question. Do you need to calibrate the camera? That's a very good question. The the ca the cameras aren't calibrated very often, but if they look really off, then then we will. But by and large, you don't really mind because you're looking at in at relative temperature differences. Um, but if you want to sort of check um, the camera um, calibration properly, um, then you know could, for example, um, put some hot some boiling water in a in a in a in a jug and stick some tape on. You'll understand why you need to do the tape in, in a bit um, to see if it's reading nearly 100 on that sort of thing. And equally, you can do some iced water and see if that's reading zero um, and that will calibrate it. But they, if you if it's very off and it's causing a problem, then we have to send them away to be calibrated and it does cost money. I'm not sure how much. Tom, have you any idea? About 200 pounds. So I hope you can see this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the different thermal cameras that we have on loan. So this is the oldest one we have actually. It's, we've been lending out for over a decade. So it's a fluke. It, this is just saying it's one of them. And this has our fairly average 160 by 120 pixel resolution. Uh, most of the cameras we have are FLIRs. There's a couple of those. Uh, and th th this group here share the features that they have uh, manual focus. So you're uh, turning this focus ring at the front. Um, their images are stored in an SD card. And when you want to get those images to save and have them on your laptop or whatever, you take the card out of here and you can plug it into your laptop using the supplied um, adapter if, if you need that. So you can plug it into any USB and get the images. Once you've got those, your images saved away, uh, particularly before you return it, please delete the images from the SD card so they don't confuse the next borrower. But um, most of our cameras, the, the majority now are of this sort in general. There's several kinds of flare here that we have on loan. Um, these five, in fact, belong to South Kansas District Council, and we're pleased to be lending those out. Uh, and we've got three recently bought uh, of this sort, a Pocket 2 camera, which is higher resolution. And, um, and these cameras kind of share the features that they have touch screens and they have USB connections. So you use a USB lead supplied with the camera to connect between the camera and your laptop. And when you plug it in, the laptop should uh, it should be like plugging a memory stick into your laptop and, you, and your laptop should recognize that it has another drive and uh, then you can open it up and see what images you've taken with, that are within the camera's internal memory, in fact. Um, but you can save those and um, it's, we definitely recommend save, save them because they should be useful later. And, uh, and again, um, before you return the camera, please delete your images from its internal memory so that the next person doesn't get totally confused trying to understand your images. And so we're not going to say a lot now about these different cameras, but um, in the... Cambridge Carbon Footprint Thermal Imaging homepage. Maybe Bart is putting a link to into chat. There are um, videos and user manuals for these different kinds of camera. So you, I suggest you look there to um, get more information about how to use the particular camera you end up borrowing. Okay, so another thing, all, all the cameras except that one fluke um, have 
different picture modes, well, display modes, if you like. So you can display just the thermal image or um, all the clears and the, and the pocket two says, well, have this feature um, whereby you can overlay the edges from the visible image, which uh, as you can see, makes it much clearer what it's looking at and um, helps you uh, uh, interpret the images much better. Because the um, visible and infrared cameras are not quite in the same place, um, depending on your distance, it's possible that the, um, these edges from the visible image become misaligned with the thermal image, but there is an adjustment for that if you need to keep, if you want to keep them aligned, particularly if you suddenly get in very close, you may have to adjust that if you don't want that misalignment. Uh, and I think all the cameras also have a kind of picture in picture mode where in fact they show the full um, pixel range of the uh, infrared image inside a wider visible image. So that's another way of finding out, being reminded where you are. But with most of these cameras, you can set them so that every time you take an image, you in fact save both the um, infrared or the, the infrared image and, and the visible image. And so we recommend that. So you get two pictures each time you uh, take, take one and um, you've got those two sorts. And again, that's really helpful for uh, exactly seeing what's being shown. So I'm just talking about another general um, thing with the cameras, that um, you, you have a, an auto mode for the color versus temperature scale. So the scale here that Nicola talked of, um, in the auto mode, the camera constantly readjusts the scale to include the hottest thing in the image, which is here, this person, uh, uh, which I guess their head is at 29 degrees. And uh, the coldest thing, something on this wall, is about five degrees. And um, this, in general, I recommend, you know, start with auto. You may not need to change away from it, but I'm just going to explain there are some advantages of using the uh, manual scale where you can adjust this range in different ways with different cameras. Um, some of the camera types call this a locked um, temperature scale rather than a manual one. And so here, uh, it's the same image, but I've adjusted it now to uh, only go up to 11 degrees. So the person now is white, showing that they're kind of off scale hot in this image. But the advantage of it, and the reason you, one reason you might want to do this uh, display is that because the whole temperature range is now narrower, you've got better temperature resolution. And so we can see the difference in these, and in particular in this image now, it makes it much clearer that uh, I think this is a, a, a window above the door, and that appears to be much hotter than anything else. So I would suspect this of being a cause of heat loss. Well, sorry, we're on the outside now, where hot means heat loss. You have to kind of switch your brain around depending whether you're on the inside or outside. But there is a, if this is a glass window, there's another caution to that, that uh, interpreting that that Nicola will tell you. Or the other possible reason for using a uh, manual locked scale is uh, if you want to compare temperatures, particularly say you want to compare 
what's happening one in one room and then you walk into another room then you can keep the temperature scale the same and so make easier comparisons the whatever this this shade of blue will mean the same thing and so here's just another demonstration of um, the auto and manual we're going to uh, so a short video when we will pan around to the right we're looking at a um, terrace houses this is an older solid wall insulation the house on this side has uh, cavity wall insulation uh, sorry so that's left is solid wall not insulated and uh, but anyway what i want you to notice here is when we pan around to the right a cold sky will come into view there and you see all the colors have changed because the temperature that scale changed when that very cold sky came into view when this is on a frosty morning and actually the camera is kind of seeing into the upper atmosphere so you often see really cold temperatures minus 60 is for most cameras their minimum and that may be what it's displaying but going on just showing you the same thing when the scale is locked as we pan around to the right you'll see that even when the cold sky comes into view it's black off scale cold and um, the color scale hasn't jumped around but normally i suggest get going with auto and see how you get on <clears throat> now just thinking about how to use the camera in terms of if you're doing a survey you're investigating your house or maybe a neighbor's or another building a community building maybe then um in general for a house i'd say allow 19 minutes maybe you can do it in an hour if you're slick but um something like that and ideally choose a time when it's cold outside now if you borrowed the camera for a short time over the weekend you may not unfortunately especially in november it may be warm but we're hoping for cold weather and um prefer because preferably you want it at least 10 degrees warmer on the inside than the outside and when you have that then you get much more vivid images the temperature differences caused by poor insulation or drafts are stronger and so you get more vivid images everything becomes clearer so if you're stuck with weather that isn't very cold then an alternative is to preheat the house uh, of course we're trying to cut your energy consumption but maybe it's worthwhile turning heating on a few hours before you do the survey and then maybe you'll get towards this temperature difference i mean if the temperature difference is only five it's still usable but it, it's more vivid if it's a good 10 degrees difference so uh, another thing to be thinking about is um as ideally you you do a thermal survey when uh the sun's not out you know a kind of overcast morning when it's cold is that might be ideal but if um any of the um uh surfaces your walls that you're looking at have been in the sunshine obviously they will have heated up and that may completely skew your thermal images in that area so just be aware um, of any walls or other surfaces that have been in the sunshine and of course that that was that will hang on that will it will be retained there and to some extent um the wind can uh, strip heat from the surface and if it's rain rained on the surface you've got wet walls then they will be a bit colder than otherwise so and of course before you go out 
particularly to somebody else's house, then check the cameras charged up. Uh, you, you, there's, uh, they're easy to recharge either through their USB lead or by plugging in the charger that we supply and uh, we check the camera's working okay. All right, and so what would you do in looking around, surveying a home? So I suggest you do look into every room because you may have surprises. In general, you're looking for what is unexpectedly hot or cold. And why is that, you're asking, you know? You're, you're trying to work out why are things unusually hot or cold? Um, and there will be all kinds of answers. You may not find all the solutions, but that's a kind of general method to um, go about a survey. And when you find somewhere that's unexpectedly hot or cold, you know, then take some more images, both close up and from a distance, and make comparisons. Um, and it's, it's really helpful to do some thermal imaging from the outside as well as the inside. We'll show you some examples later of where you might see things on the outside that you couldn't um, see a problem with if you were just on the ins inside. So take plenty of images. You know, there's, there's room for hundreds and hundreds of images in these cameras. And, um, and I suggest making notes. Or, or if you're doing it, for somebody else, get them to take notes. And then they'll know that when, you know, there's a problem with the window in the bedroom or whatever, then they will know it's Fred's bedroom and they can remember what that, you know, what it all meant. So that's the end of my little bit there. Any more questions on those topics? Um, yes, there were loads of questions. Um, some of them will be addressed later. And I think there was a lot of anticipation for the slide on inside and outside temperatures. Um, I think we might come back to that a little bit later. Um, there was also a question about what is a good time um, for the for the, uh, the survey to take place. Um, nighttime was suggested. And of course, then that's the time when temperature differences are large. So generally, that's good. But we talked about this MSX imaging technology where the visual camera is blended with the thermal camera. And of course, that needs a bit of light to work properly. Um, any comments, Nicola, Tom, on when to do your survey? Uh, I, th I think that's another bit. Uh, it will depend also on, um, you know, what else is going on in your life. And when do you have the opportunity to use the camera you borrowed? But you can use it at night. You know, the infrared doesn't need daylight at all, but you get a bit of extra information if, if it's bright enough for the visible camera to work too. Um, there were a few more questions about battery life and charging. I think all cameras, uh, well, most of the smaller cameras charge through USB. Uh, I think the larger ones have their own charger. That's right. And, uh, and typically they have a um, three or four hour battery life. In fact, we, we had one camera, a Clear C2 last year, that suddenly um, lasted a, you know, a, only a tiny length of time. And we have um, replaced its battery now. But if you have a problem like with the USB connected cameras, if for whatever reason you're finding that they're not lasting as long as you want, and if you have one of those small power banks that you might use to recharge your phone, then connect that into the camera through its USB socket, and um, that'll keep it going longer because you'll be topping it up. Um... Ah, there's a very good question here. Do damp walls affect readings, including indoors? Well, um, they can do, yes. So finding, uh, imagine, uh, you, you know, that you, you, you're actually suffering from damp walls 
indoors. Maybe, maybe there's something leaking, a gutter or condensation inside, some cause of dampness indoors that you haven't picked up on. So sometimes thermal imaging can help with that, but it can well, it, be confusing. It, can be confusing it some because the damp is normally colder um because the water evaporates and that makes the surface colder so damp will it, show up as a cold area it it can work the other way though because if the wall is wet through then you may uh, it may be uh, much less insulating and and therefore um and i suppose what i'm saying it applies to the outside view that would that would make it colder on the inside too. Yeah. So yes, sorry, I agree. So 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 um yes, look for cold cold patches may be caused by damp, and then maybe you want to have a good feel of that and uh, see if you can work out why. And as you say, if it's a, if it's a very very if it's the insulation is damp, then that usually means it it doesn't insulate very well. So that will be a heat loss problem. Yeah, humidity is always tricky. I think that's the yeah. upshot here. <laughs> we we um, haven't talked about why we do in, outside as well as inside. Um, we've, okay. we've got a slide, a slide that will show that. Okay. Right. Up. Okay. Um, then there were a few questions about uh, how do you decide or how is it decided what camera you can borrow? Um, I think, uh, Nicola, do you have any words on that? I haven't used the booking system for a while or at all. I, I, I am coming, coming. That's in the final okay. section about Perfect. booking cameras and choosing them. Um, I think there were a few questions um, regarding the general use of the cameras. Um, I think we can safely say that all the cameras we uh, loan out are very suitable for this kind of work. They have the required accuracy. Uh, the resolution is not a problem. Of course, higher resolution is nicer, but with this clever trick of the... Um, uh, the combining the visual and the infrared camera, you get very acceptable pictures, even with the simpler cameras. Uh, I don't think there's any need to worry that you might miss out on the best camera because you uh, got one of the older ones or one of the smaller ones. I think they're all very, very good. Um, and th there's a few more. Sorry, Nicola, you want to no, say carry something? No, on, carry on about. Um, uh, yeah, there were a few quest more questions about image storage uh, and transfer. Um, I think the pick the all the cameras can store as said in the presentation, and they connect through USB for readout or through the uh, SD card. Of course, it is very tricky if you don't have a computer of any sort to get the pictures off and get the photos. Uh, that's not the service we provide, uh, but maybe you can ask a friend, colleague, neighbor to transfer the photos for you. Well, you could ask your host. They might do it. For your you. host, that, yes. That's, that's true. And so you need a device of some sort with a, uh, a regular rectangular USB socket, really, to um, connect. Uh, there were, yeah, yeah. There were another few questions about, um, with a very good point made by Jess, that it's sometimes difficult to track down what you are actually taking pictures of, especially when you get the hang of it and you take lots of pictures which I would very much advise you to do, because uh, in my case, I always forget to take the picture I was actually interested in afterwards. Um, so I would I would suggest to take loads of pictures, but also um, take loads of notes and maybe even use your phone or voice notes to detail what you're doing so you can find back what all these pictures meant and what they were, uh, what they were representing afterwards. Right. I did see some questions about reflections and technical aspects. I'm trying very hard to avoid using the word emissivity. So <laughs> if I don't say emissivity, it's because I'm trying not to. Right. Um, when the light hits a surface, it either bounces off, it's reflected or it's absorbed. And the same goes for IR radi infrared radiation. Um, bare metal. So this means that when you're looking at bare metal, you get a mix of the reflected light as well as the emitted light. And this is somewhat confusing for the camera and they will give the wrong temperature reading. Um, this is an easy thing to fix, however. Um, so for example, with the kettle, um, you can see that shining, that the point there at SP2 is, is only 32 degrees um, and it really ought to be at nearly 100. 
So the fix is to put some tape, attach some, some tape, um, which is sort of electrical PVC tape or something, um, which we do supply normally with the cameras, but you probably got some anyway. Um, just stick a bit of that on, leave it for a minute or two to, to sort of um, get the temperature of the surface, and then you can take the picture and there it says 95. So which is that's the true temperature. So reflections are a serious problem that you have to be aware of. And the other problem is, actually isn't a problem, but it's quite interesting, is transparency. Um, and the really interesting thing is that transparency for different objects varies with, um, is different for visible light and, and for infrared light. And, and this, this um, nice picture demonstrates it. So we've got this chap is wearing glasses um, and in visible light, um, we can see that the glasses are transparent and we can see his eyes. And in infrared light, they are not. You'll actually see a mix of reflected um, and emitted light from the glass in infrared. On the other hand, the, here he's holding a bin bag, which is most definitely opaque in visible light. Um, and in the infrared light, it's actually partially transparent. So you can see through it. Um, actually, we're not terribly interested usually in the temperature of bin bags. So that isn't too much of a problem. But um, if you did, it, it only applies to certain sorts of plastic. The PVC tape is what you need. It, whatever happens, if you're not getting an accurate reading because of transparency or reflection, stick some tape on it and that will allow you to get a good reading. Um, paint is fine, brick is fine, carpet is fine. So an awful lot of the kind of surfaces that you tend to meet um, should be absolutely fine to use. Um, glass may or may not be okay, um, but it's not reliably okay. Bare metal definitely isn't okay. And concrete, we're a bit confused about because there's different reports and um, it probably depends on the different kind of concrete or something. I think those are most of the surfaces that you're likely to meet. We're not too interested in bin bags, as I said. Um, so here we've got a picture. We're looking at the outside of a house um, and we're looking at different parts of the surfaces. So we've got some windows which are um, slightly reflective, but actually not bad usually. Um, and you've got some brickwork and you've got um, some glass work here. Well, yeah, the window is a bit different. We're looking from the outside, so the leaky surfaces are hot. The roof is warm, but that's leaky, definitely. By the way, it seems not usefully cloudy today, which is helpful. Um, the wall insulation is quite reasonable. It's not too warm. It's certainly cooler than the roof. Um, and in the glass here, we're seeing reflections. Those are not, we are not seeing people inside the house. They are reflections. Now, the easiest way to tell if it is reflections, if you're not sure, is to move. And if you move and the reflections move, then it's a reflection. But if they don't move, then they're not a reflection. If you see what I mean. It's usually pretty obvious. But you do have to remember. And you can sit there staring at this thing and think, oh, I wonder what that bright spot is. And then you suddenly sort of move accidentally not thinking about it and you say oh oh it was me right um more glass reflections sometimes we talked about the, the night sky being very cold um and sometimes you can find that the window is cold when you would expect it to be warm and that's because it's actually reflecting the sky now, if you think about it, we're standing at ground level and looking up at the upper window, the, the light is, is reflected for, partially from the sky. So you might think, oh, gosh, that's an incredibly well insulated um, window, but it isn't. It's because it's reflecting from um, the sky. Um, so you have to be, you know, sometimes it's a sometimes it can be a bit misleading. Um, the lower window, on the other hand, you're kind of straight at it and it's it's not. Um, you might see reflections from you and behind you, but you won't see reflections of the sky at least. Um, so again, you can be moderately careful, but most of the time it's not bad. Most of the time, the, the windows give a reasonable, at least useful results. It may not be accurate, but it's useful. And of course, if you're in doubt and you want to know, stick some PVC tape on it. Here's another example where we're looking at a door. Doors, this door is sort of 
partly wooden and, and partly metal. Um, and this area here um, is classically hot and you will find that if you step to one side, you will find it is a, it is a um, reflection of you, it moves. Um, why are the houses so different? Yeah, this is, the, I, I'm gonna ask you what you think here. So we're looking at two different houses here. One on the left is, is cold and the one on the right is, is apparently warm. Um, and in particularly the windows seem to be um, leaking heat and particularly this window. So what do we think might be the cause of the fact that this house is leaking heat through the windows and that one isn't? One has got uh, double glazed windows and the other one not. It could be. That isn't the only it, reason it, though. What, one, one's got heating on and one hasn't. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree with Diane. It's, it's either unoccupied or unheated. Yes. That This is something that comes up a lot. Um, this house here um, is the, the people who live in it are quite abstemious with their heating. And the, the house here has some elderly people in who um, are not well and need a lot more house. Uh, it's, my house on, it's my house. It's my house. Yes. Well, you, well, you used to be abstemious with the heating, but you're a bit less yeah. abstemious now. Uh, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the front of a house and you can see windows. We're looking at, um, I think it's an upper story, in fact, but that's not that relevant in this particular case. We've got a, a wall, a radiator against the wall. We do indeed have a radiator against the wall. Um, it's it's quite nice when it shows up as badly as this, although it's it's actually very bad when it shows up as badly as this. Um, do you know what you can do about it? Radiator reflector? Yeah, exactly. Put a radiator reflector behind it. If you've got a solid wall, solid walls, and you don't have insulation on there, and you don't have reflective foil, it is going to be pretty bulk. People do ask, why is it um, colder in the middle? And we are pretty certain that that is because the radiator's got a bit sludged up, and the the um, the flow of the hot water through the radiator is just sort of missing that bit, which is another example of a radiator not functioning correctly. And that one needs a, a power flush or something. Can that mean, hello, can that mean that the insulation in the wall is not uh, uh, sufficient? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, well, uh, I suppose if the radiators are very warm, if you're running your radiators at 80, then you might be, you probably see them even if it is quite well insulated. Um, in fact, the temperature difference isn't massive, um, but it is significant. So you should, should see radiator heat in all your walls? Um, well, outside. you probably won't. You won't, you, you often don't. You won't see it. If you've got your radiators running at a, a lower temperature, like we've been told to, in order to get better performance from our boiler, even if we do have, um, if we if still with gas, we still get a better um, efficiency if, if we run them at a lower temperature. But if you're running it at sort of at, at 60 or so, um, and you've got well insulated walls, then you won't see much. Can I just say, um, because I, this was a house of somebody else that I was helping, um, you know, surveying our home, and um, it, it wasn't particularly well insulated in this wall under the radiator, uh, where, where the radiator is. But um, but it's also I wanted to point out that you wouldn't see this problem from the inside of the house. Mm. All you would see would be a hot radiator. No surprise. And so here is an example <laughs> of things you might see from the outside that you cannot see inside. Also, the earlier one where the, the whole of the roof on the outside was visibly warmer because the loft uh, wasn't properly insulated. And again, that would be hard to know from inside. So it's worth doing both. Another thing from the point of the reason we do it on the outside is because it's, if you're on the inside, it's very easy to see drafts coming in, but it's not easy to see drafts going out. And, you know, what comes in must go out normally. Um, but there is another way to get around that. Um, if you've got a house with quite a lot of extractors, it's it's much nicer if you can put all the extractors on and try and get try and, and and suck the 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 sort of drafts to come in 
get get the pressure in the house low low so that the drafts are all coming in rather than some coming in and some going out because the extractor is doing the out bit. And that way you don't have to spend so much time looking for drafts on the outside. Do things always look warm from the outside when they're cold on the inside and vice versa? I don't think there's actually a normal temperature you should, you should see. It's, it's all about the differences, uh, as was explained in the pictures. It's the red versus blue rather than is it 14.3 or 14.5 degrees. There are but, some but, fairly subtle technical reasons why you tend to get bigger um, temperature differences on the inside on the, than on the outside. Um, it's to do with the nature of the surface and, and the um, sort of thermal resistance of the surface. Um, and the, the external, external thermal resistance depends a lot on the weather. Um, so if it's very windy, then it will be less resistance. Um, and if it's wet, it will be less resistance. And that tends to reduce the temperature differences that you're seeing, which is um, a bit frustrating. So Fantastic. normally it's better to do as much as you can on the inside, but there are some things that you can only see on the outside, like the radiators we saw um, and the drafts if they're going out rather than going in. Just just recapping on inside outside. If if you're inside, then anything, a wall that, or whatever that it looks colder, is means you're losing heat through it. But if you're looking at the same wall from the outside, then the leaky bit will be looking warmer because uh, the heat is coming through that wall and making it warm on the outside. Can I just ask a question here? Um, so between the inside and outside, inside you're looking for blue, which is uh, cold on the inside, and outside you're looking for uh, red, which is leaking heat. That's yeah. right. Good summary. Coming from the out, uh, coming from the inside to the outside, so different colours. Blue, look, looking for blue inside, looking for red outside. Yeah, that's not look, to that... say it's actually hotter on the outside than on the inside. It's just hot relative to the other things that you yes, see yes, on the outside. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> in, okay. in the one of the resources um, that we've got online um, is another um, set of images. And it's got at the end, it's got a discussion about the kind of temperature differences you can expect with different kinds of walls. And it does talk a little bit about this thermal resistance problem. And it's got a little diagram, I think, of um, um, the temperature difference across the wall, um, which explains about the resistances and things. But that's only for the techie minded. Generally, I think um, it's, it's not a case that as soon as there's a funny reading, you apply the tape, but when you're looking at glazing, metals, very shiny surfaces, it is good to use the tape and then point the middle of the camera to, on, onto the tape and, and, and accept that reading. Um, it, I don't think it's needed to put tape on doors, bookcases, teacups, whatever else, you know, general materials, dull materials. Uh, but again, we should repeat that it is about the differences you see uh, and not about the absolute temperature scales. All the cameras are capable of doing that, but it would need adjustment and calibrations, which is exactly going to Nicola's, um, the word she can't say, emissivity. Uh, but that's <laughs> beyond the scope of these uh, this presentation tonight, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you only want to use the PVC tape. If you see something, especially if it's to do with, with glass, um, and and you think, well, I, that's not that surprising. Um, am I am I am I missing something? And if you if it's not obviously reflections, um, then if you're not sure, then then try the tape. But it is type, quite time consuming using the tape because you've got to wait for it for the um, for it to warm up a bit. So you have to wait a minute or two before you can take a reading off it. Um, and you also need to get fairly close, as, as somebody pointed out. You know, especially if you've got a low res camera, but it isn't usually necessary uh, in order to to sort of see the kind of differences that we're looking at. So, so to be clear, um, we we keep talking about shiny metal. If that metal is painted, then it it won't behave that way. Remember, we're just talking about the very surface. So, if it's paint on the surface, 
um, all paints, except metallic paints, actually, those shiny paints, but all normal paints have um, uh, more, more normal temperature scale and you can trust your readings. Whereas bare shiny metal is the problem. Okay, while we let that sink in, there's also a question. There's a question and a support uh, statement on uh, whether we can borrow the cameras in summer to look at uh, things like overheating hotspots in the house and to see whether a aircon or otherwise cooling unit is behaving as it should. Yes, so uh, there, there is a resource in the place we mentioned the thermal imaging page about using uh, thermal cameras in heat waves. It's not so straightforward as the winter use, um, but it can be very revealing. Um, and there's, thank you. Um, there's another question, uh, at least a couple of questions about um, temperature differences. Um, I guess it relates to the temperature differences you can see in one single picture. So say you point the camera at a wall and when what is still acceptable and what is becoming worrisome i think that is the upshot of the question fairly obviously one degree... it, yeah if it's a large area then smaller differences matter more you know i mean you know if, it, if it's a large difference on a large area that's catastrophic so more than two degrees is quite a big difference and if that's on a, a tall significant area then that's that's serious but if it's even five degrees but it's only a little tiny bit then that's probably okay um but five degrees over you know like the light fishing or something that, that that's quite a lot um so yeah I, I wouldn't worry if it's less unless if it's less than two degrees unless it's the whole wall right or unless you're trying to get to kind of passive house standards in your house, oh yeah but mo most of us aren't the tape that we put in with the cameras i think is 19 millimeters wide but um and you might want to experiment with other sorts of tape but it, pvc electrical tape is still a standard that uh, thermal imagers talk about and it has the advantage of being fairly easy to unpeel afterwards ah good point yes <laughs> we're going on to borrowing cameras now and um how, how you go about that <clears throat> so the first thing we ask you to do uh, when you're borrowing a camera is to sign. We have a Google form for the uh, camera borrowing agreement. And I don't think there's any big surprises in this, but we're asking you to agree to keep the camera safe with you or in a locked place. You know, don't leave it on the pub, in the, on the pub table while you go out. Um, don't lend it to anyone else. You know, we're, we're lending it to you. And the reason, the reason for these is that um, our cameras are insured, but they're insured to be with you, the borrower, not uh, anyone else. And, um, and so we're, I'm going to explain in a minute about arranging, collecting and return times. And so please uh, stick to those. And then when you've finished um, surveying or investigating a building, please, uh, Phil, we have a short form that um, where we ask you to tell us, uh, you know, what was this building? What, what did you find that was interesting? Uh, and, um, do, you know, do you plan to do something about it? You know, is it a, a, a loft hatch you're going to insulate or whatever? And, and that's very helpful to us if you can fill that, because it gives us much more information and evidence about uh, what uses people are putting to these cameras that um, helps with our reporting and fundraising. So, OK, so now we're into the uh, nitty gritty of booking a camera. But let me say again, we, we have a booking system that has all been uh, renewed for the 14 cameras that are going to be on loan about the normal collection return times. So normally, 
we are lending cameras through the week, through on weekdays, where you would pick a camera up on a Monday afternoon and return it on a Friday morning. And so that's uh, the longer period, but uh, of course not everyone's free to use it then. So the alternative is to book a camera to use over the weekend and you, we ask you to collect it on a Friday afternoon and return it on a Monday morning. And so you can see there's a, and there's a little half hour gap between these two times so that um, we, that's why we need you to return the camera on in within that time period so it's ready to be lent out to the next person. And so we have 14 volunteer camera hosts shown on this map, uh, which you'll see um, on the web page for this. You can zoom in much better on that. But here are the names of the locations and what kinds of camera they happen to have. And so um, in the booking system, there's a page where we're giving this information and saying now, so just have a look here and choose which camera you would prefer to borrow. And then going on, uh, you, will, you will click on that particular camera. This example happens to be with a camera that's hosted in Bassingbourne. Uh, it's a Fair C2. And if you clicked on that, you would then get a calendar looking something like this. And so the uh, color key here is showing that the black air dates are available. Or these are the collection days. So you, we want you to choose the Monday or Friday when you want to collect. Of course, by the time you get there, oh. some of them may be showing brown, which means, sorry, they're already booked. And so in this example, it's like I've just clicked on the 17th of November to collect my camera and it changes color a bit while my booking is in progress. And um, you fill in in this form, think your name and then so on your details. And at the bottom, we also ask you to select a half an hour period the collections, in fact, are always done on an afternoon between 1 and 5 p.m. And so just to get the ball rolling, we choose a time where which you would prefer to collect the camera, a, a half hour period. So here I'm saying, well, I'm, I would like to collect it between 2.30 and 3. OK, and then when you've uh, completed that and um, hopefully uh, your booking has been accepted, the one exception might be is if while you were trying to book that camera, somebody else actually can press the button uh, submitting their booking before you. You might have to start again, but that's unlikely, I think. And um, so anyway, then when your booking has been accepted, which you'll get an on-screen verification, but then also you'll get a, an email pretty immediately. And, um, and the email will be from CCF Bookings. So you can probably find it if you look for that. And in the email, it will show you, not written in here, but it will give you the full contact details of you, the booker, and it will give the full contact details of the camera host. So you know where you're going to go to collect the camera. And um, the host will also get a copy of the same email. So they can see here that you have booked this camera. Now it's saying 6th of November, and you have suggested the 12.30, actually I don't think there was a 12, I think it should say, I think it should be after one this time. Anyway, you, you've selected a um, 
time, a half hour period, and when you'd like to collect it. And so we asked the host to just check this. And if for whatever reason, this is an inconvenient time for the host to be ready there to hand over the camera, then they will contact you, the book workers. They have your details and they will say, whatever. I'm going to be out then, but could you come at four instead? Whatever. And between you, maybe you need to have a phone call and you can arrange a time that suits you both. Both. And, um, and so uh, down here, yes, yeah, so uh, another comment here. If for whatever reason you didn't get this booking confirmation email within, say, an hour of your of having a booking confirmed on the screen, then it could have gone in your spam folder. But if you really can't find it, then um, please email this email address. This um, ti camera at cambridgecolumnfootprint.org is the absolutely general email to send, let us know if there's a problem. And um, and if you haven't received your booking confirmation email, then that's a problem. And we'll look at, look, investigate and confirm your booking or whatever. And then, so this is asking you to look out for an email or maybe a phone call from your camera host. They might suggest, as I said, maybe it's not convenient to come then. Please could you come at after four or whatever. And if there's any change, keep the host updated. If for some reason you are ill or whatever, let's um, let them know. And so those are the basics here. Uh, in your booking confirmation email, you do also have these two links which if you click on them, if you decide you really need to change the date of your booking and choose another time, um, then you can click on that and book your camera, change the booking time for another, and the host will get to hear that you're not coming after all when they, they first expected. Or indeed, if you just wanted to cancel your booking, then you can click on that link. So you've got a few options there, but uh, I think I've explained the basic thing. The, these, the hosts, uh, Nick, I, I'm a host and Nicola has been, we're, we're just volunteers. So, um, uh, you know, trying to work with them to make this work. Uh, and okay, and so here again, this is the thermal imaging homepage, uh, the address of it. Fairly simple. So any of the things we've been mentioning, you can access via this page. Um, I think the main question here is whether it's possible to do multiple bookings to uh, have a look at before after situations or um, you know, when you miss out on because of the weather or uh, yes. other reasons why it wouldn't work. Yes, yes, you, yes, you can. Um, and so uh, you know, just just like in that situation, you might you might have had impossible weather, or it may be that you really want to look at some building that uh, is in progress. Uh, but then you can borrow it more than once. But be aware, there's a lot of demand for these. So you know, please don't make unnecessary bookings because there's plenty of other people want to benefit from this. Uh, oh, and, and the other thing I was going to mention is that we're also trying to encourage and help people who are going to borrow the camera to do multiple surveys. So last year, there were two groups of people. There was a group of people in Hayden who did 18 thermal imaging surveys in their village. And in fact, they're planning to do it again in December. And so, in fact, the camera that I host, you'll see there's an asterisk against it in the booking list. And that's saying uh, this camera is worth reserving it mostly for people who would like to do multiple bookings. 
and so we suggest that you email that ti camera at ccf.org um, to arrange with me because you probably want to have it for more than just through weekdays or one weekend you know that's we will work out together um when when your group or, or maybe you're particularly keen to do several homes or maybe you know community buildings or churches or schools or whatever if you're up for that that's great it's multiplying the impact and and thank you to the person who compared this to glastonbury that's really too kind <laughs> <laughs> so, so the rush um, for tickets might be the same though one interesting question someone's asked um okay so how do we actually having identified the problems with the um with heat loss, so how do we fix them? We haven't discussed that today because it would make the session rather long and we would had the feedback said that we wanted to concentrate on the images, but there's lots of information about how to fix various sorts of problems um, on the website and possibly also on the transition website. Mainly it's to do with just putting insulation on. If it's drafts, it's draft stripping or putting, um, so, you know, draft excluders under doors um that sort of thing the the really tricky one i think is the thermal bridge um with the the doorstep going across from you know across the door threshold fixing that is a big deal but but you can go a long way by um sort of just making sure you've got some rugs covering close by and and there was that nice thing you you had with the with the um curtain wasn't there tom and where you hang a curtain over the door and, and it's in such a way yes. that when you open the door, it automatically lifts the curtain off the floor so it just doesn't get in the way. Yes, yes, uh, that, that's good. Or, or indeed have a, uh, a fabric sausage at the bottom of the door mm -hmm. that um, is loosely attached to the door so it stays in place, stays next to the door as you swing it to and fro. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, but... and then when it comes to things like um, lesser boxes, then it gets a bit more difficult if you've got drafts around letterboxes. We don't we don't have a solution for that, do we? You can buy uh, brush strips to put on your letterbox. They slightly impede the uh, pushing in of large envelopes. Uh, but also there are some clever, it's a clever one. I can't remember what it's called. I'll put it in the uh, chat in the follow-up email. Um, there's, there's another letterbox closer, as it were, that uh, seems to work quite well. Has anyone got a nice solution for cat flaps? <laughs> well, um, I think in general, cat flaps have got better at being uh, draft free. But someone, is it you, Nicola, has a, a airlock cat flap? No, um, I haven't got I've, one, but I think I have a friend who did. <laughs> yes, I've seen somebody uh, where they have... Uh, you know, a double tap flap. I think that's uh, us, Tom. We've got one that goes into the greenhouse and then into outside. So yeah. oh, great. So that's another way of doing it. But, mm -hmm. And yet the cats may need special training. I think. How was yours, Fran? They get used to it pretty quickly with treats. <laughs> okay. It's me uh, handing over a camera to a, a keen borrower, and um, we hope you. Get on well finding where your home is leaking heat. Okay, well, have a good evening and uh, good luck with your thermal imaging.